This is a J Mix exclusive. <laughs> Man, you want to tell us about uh, first? I say your name. Yeah, and we got spell it for me for the lower thirds because we didn't sit that by there. So. All right. Hey, what's up? My name is Mosey M D. It's M O E Z M D. Periods between the M and D, uh, like a doctor. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's make sure. Well, actually, no periods. Just just together though. Okay. M D. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Period. Okay, sound is good. I like the sound. Sounds hey, good. Hey, hey. All right, sound is good. I'll take good care. All right, now, <laughs> and and w w shout out. Look at the camera straight on. Shout out to J Mix and the J Mix channel. J Mix. Mosey. This is Mosey. Shout out for the J Mix channel. Hey, what's up? This is Mosey MD. I'm giving a shout out to J Mix and the J Mix channel. Straight up. How's it working? Looks right. great. Yeah, looks yeah. fantastic. All right, We're, let's go. You're I'm, rolling. I want to talk to you a little bit about Funk House Records. Can you tell me about the lineup? You got uh, you got Gats Mojo album coming out. Mm -hmm. um, Rick Prince, Hollywood S. Uh, what, what's in store for Funk House? Got uh, a lot of artists. I have a lot of artists that are located in different areas. Yeah. Much like a major. Uh, the only difference is I, I let everyone live where they are. And I have multiple artists that's going to reach each region as well as overseas. And so I have, at the moment, I'm going to bring out uh, myself, my, out, my R&B album called Soul Finger. And, um, and Gat, they have an album that I'm bringing out. It's called Mojo. They're from Indianapolis. And um, they're, they're a guy and, and girl group. They're like a rap, they're a rap group, but they're like a couple, like, you know, two guy, a guy and a girl rapping, you know. And you can edit that however you want, because I know I stumble. But um, uh, also, I have uh, Money Wells and Hollywood S, who are original Funk House members from when we started years and years and years ago. Uh, we started Funk House in 87. And uh, they're original artists, and all this time we've been developing and trying to get their their ball rolling. And uh, they have albums that they're about to release, as well as we have new artists, uh, Ricky Prince. He just came to us recently within the last six months, and he is a very, very, very good artist. He's very lyrical, he's very, his performance, his, everything is really good, and, uh, and, uh, I have also from Long Beach, uh, Louis Bagels, who is a new artist as well, and, um, Moosey, Moosey Moo, he's actually from, uh, L.A., and he is, uh, the hype man for Sugar Free, and also, his brother is in the group Second to None. So he talked to me recently, and so now he's going to be part of Funk House, and we're going to release his album. It's ridiculous, too. And uh, so we're just really trying to spread it out. I have artists overseas, uh, Don Stormy from uh, Africa. And um, the, the thing is, we, we just keep building uh, in different areas. and. And we're gonna hit them hard. We're gonna hit them all at once, and and put the promotion plan in, in play, and really get them in all of the right areas. I've been really taking time for the last six to eight years, trying to put together all of the elements we need to promote ourselves and make our own machine. Because the way that production goes, the produce, you know, releasing records anyway, it's a lot different than it used to be, and. I see a fault in it, which is they don't promote on the street anymore. They don't go and push for to be on BET or MTV or you know the video places and fight for the radio. They they take the the other routes, which are readily and easy to you know it's easily available, like the iTunes. And, and Amazon and everything, and that's fine. But I think what's missing from the puzzle is the big picture, 
what makes the label, the big labels, be able to sell, but take the elements of the real truth in the music and be able to push it without any red tape. That is my plan with Funk House right there. Are we gonna see another second to none release? Or NGN? NGN? Yeah. Absolutely. We have been talking about it. In fact, he just called me about five minutes ago. We were trying to plan a studio session so that we could bring NGN back. But the only problem was the, the, uh, one of the main members of our group in 97, he had a really bad car accident. And it kind of, that's what kind of kept us from releasing a the record then. And so he's recovered, but he's not 100%. So we're thinking about revamping it and really, you know, using me and Ron Love, which now he goes by rap, R-A-P, yeah. real as possible. And uh, we're going to revamp the group and we're going to give them what, what they should have had, what, 20 years ago, right? <laughs> um. Speaking of 20 years ago, mm -hmm. um, multi-platinum selling producer, and not just in the area of, of hip-hop, um, but also, you know, you've done work all over the place. Most notable, uh, because the man's right there on your shirt. Can you tell us how you personally uh, initiated, how, how you first met up with Tupac and started to work with Tupac? Absolutely. Well, at the time, I was working with an artist who I grew up with, and, and Snoop, and everybody we all grew up with. He was actually the first rapper from Long Beach to get a major deal. And with Interscope, it was their first black artist. I believe that's right, yeah. That was the first black artist. And so uh, they were building him up, and he was from Long Beach, and they were trying to get him going and everything. And uh, it took about five years where you know we went back and forth um, they wanted him to sound like Heavy D. He was very versatile. So they wanted him to sound like Heavy D, and they wanted him to go back to doing his gangster stuff because Snoop stuff had gotten really popular. And so when we, re when we redid it and started doing the gangster stuff, Tupac was in Interscope and heard the project being played by John McClain, who was the A&R at the time. And so he heard it and said, who is that? And he's like, oh, this is Sky Radio, this is from Long Beach. No, no, who's on the beat? Who did the music? I got I to gotta meet this guy. So they said, okay, well, we're going to call uh, Radio's manager, try to get in touch with him. And went through me, and they proposed that I would do uh, three remixes so that he could see how I work with him. So they sent me uh, From the Cradle to the Grave, uh, Running from the Police, and Lord Knows. So all in one day, we flipped it. I got Radio, who I was originally doing work for. He did the hook on the running for the police. The Rasta thing that everybody thinks is somebody else. It's actually Radio, rest in peace. And um, then Pac heard that from the cradle to the grave and asked me to send a, a cassette with tracks on it. Just tracks so that he could try to you know, see what I got. And I sent that to him. That was on a Wednesday, probably the same day I think it was I did those remixes before I went to the studio. And then he heard it on that Friday because they overnighted him. And then by Wednesday of the next week, I was being flown to New York to work on Outlaw. But I didn't know what we were going to work on at the time, but it turned out to be Outlaw. And uh, I get to the studio and he's like, Mosey. What's up? And hugging me and like super like just charged up and made me amped up like oh wow you know it, the whole energy just picked up and we vibed and he he was asking me um, about the the tracks that I had on the cassette he said it was one in particular that he really wanted and he I kept going through my discs and I'm like this one I said, no 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 I like that one too but that's not the one that's not the one and then he finally he just got the cassette and played it and I said oh. Actually, I did that track for an R&B singer. He was supposed to write to it, and he couldn't come up with anything, so he gave me the cassette back. I actually was just taping over that tape. <laughs> and he heard that, he said, well, it's a rap now. <laughs> and I was like, whoa. And uh, 
And oh, then that day, that exact same day, he told me that from the cradle to the grave was going to be the first single, and they were going to take the other version off the album and put mine on the album, and they were going to release it. So, and I mean, as soon as I got home from New York, maybe a couple of days later, I was hearing from the cradle to the grave. And I was like, wow, a week goes by, and now I'm on the radio. It was incredible. Well. Um, how long was it from the time that Tupac was listening to, was it a, a demo or an album put out by radio? It was, it was an album that we were working on, and he was hearing the, the material from the studio. Okay. How long was that until you heard it, you went and produced and then heard your track on, on the radio? It was a week and a half. Wow. That from, point. from him hearing it to me having that from the cradle to the grave on the radio was a week and a half. Wow. I could not believe it. Now, um, you brought up Outlaw. What's the story behind that session um, and Ra Ra? Can you tell us a little bit about Ra Ra? Well, see, now Ra Ra, I didn't know. I didn't know him, and I didn't know the guy that did the, the game ain't the same, the roster part. These were guys that Tupac knew from the street. He was on his way to the studio. The little boy said he wanted to go. So he said, come on. And the other guy, he wanted to go. He said, come on. And he really was, you know, trying to find something for them to do on it. And he bounced around ideas and he goes, what about that, that Snoop where, where he goes, uh, um, I think, was it the game made the same? Was the game made the same? Oh, I can't remember. I think it was something like that. And well, anyway, he, he flipped, I think it was something that Snoop did, and he flipped that to make that. And he said, I'm gonna have the little boy say, oh, the dear God, dear God, I wonder, could, yes. And, it, and the little boy couldn't say it by himself, so he stood behind him at the mic and said it with him. So like when you hear the voices together, they actually did it together. Because he was like, dear God, I wonder, can you, you know, help, helping him do it. And it was cool, it was fast. What do you think that, uh, because all these years later and the legendary status that he hit, what do you think at this point that people's biggest misconception is when it comes to Tupac? Uh, that he's inhuman. You know, like a lot of people put a whole lot of extra on um, him. Like, you know, I've heard people say stuff like, you know, he's like Jesus, he's like God, you know. And he really was... A regular person who had feelings and knew how to express them and it's just uh, and people really thought that he was like a mean evil person like they kept asking me were you okay in the studio did he didn't like pull a gun on you and I'm like no he looked up to me he was like my friend we, we kept in touch and when they had to go to the studio I would page him and wake them up he would say, page me, wake me, wake us up so we can get to the studio more, we gotta be on time. And so it was that kind of a relationship. And you know, if you don't really know him and you listen to the songs, you think that he is those songs and the characters that he play in those movies. And he is really a person who can express and also make people feel the emotion of what he's talking about because it's stuff that people go through. People have, have gone through or are going through, so they feel it and they think, oh my gosh, he's just a, he's, you know, they just put super extra on it, but he was a man, he was a human, he had feelings, he was just like all of us. He was tender at times, he was strong at times, he was mad at times, he was crazy at times. We all go through it. We just don't have to go through the press, you know what I mean? The press don't get to see it. <laughs> did you ever see? Uh, did you ever see his temper? Never. Mm -mm. I heard his temper when he was in jail, and we were trying to record this song. Uh, we had the Outlaws on it, and Young, I mean uh, Thug Life. They were both on it, all of them, and we were trying to get Pac's vocal over the phone to rap on it. Now, if I had really thought, I could have send him a cassette and he could have listened to it in the headphones or whatever but we tried to do it over the phone where he they mic'd the telephone in the booth 
and then they played the sound through the thing. So it was like a delay going to him, and then his delay coming back, and you hear it all on the phone. And so we were like, we, we I don't think we're gonna be able to do this. And then the last words he ever, I ever heard him say was, like he was mad, really mad. And that was the only time. Other than that, I didn't really see it. It was really workaholic, you know. Fair enough. Um, you're one of the few producers that Pac worked with while he was alive that remixed his work mm -hmm. um, for release. Mm -hmm. Did uh, What was his favorite track from you? Did he ever say? He never said it, no. It was because things were moving so fast. Um, the ones we ended up doing, uh, it was only one that was on that cassette other than Outlaw that ended up being done and it was for the, uh, the Outlaws album when it was called Dramacidal. Dramacidal, yes. And I didn't actually do the track. Um, my guy, Lamorius Tyler, did the track and they wanted me to sing the hook so I sang the hook on it. But it was written, the hook was written by Pac and Edie. And so they were rapping on that. But uh, other than that, we did all of the tracks there. Like he'd go, you know, I got this idea. And I go, oh, okay, we, we do it. You know. With the exception of young, young. He gave me a cassette of Cameo C. Strange and said, take this back and make a beat off, flip it, so we can make a song off of it. Oh, okay. And at the time we were recording um, uh, Sucker for Love, the original version. I did the original version of that. And, um, and that night he gave me that cassette. So uh, I took it, I took, my, my equipment was broke at the time. So I went to my, my friend Lamorius Tyler house and programmed it on his equipment. And then he added some stuff to it. And the next day we went to the studio and, and dropped it. But everything else was really on the spot. Now that, uh, would it, was it common for him to ask you to like take a beat and flip it around. I know he did it a lot at Beth Row mm -hmm. with um, other artists' music such as Nas. He would flip one of his beats. Mm -hmm. um, what, that was common for him to do. Yeah, we did one uh, that he had me flip that uh, uh, Bonnie and Clyde. Now I can't remember the song because it never, I don't think it got released. Uh, and then he had me flip uh, Street Life and and we made Thug Life off of that. And I think, a f yeah, a few of them were, like, flipped this into that. Yeah. How did you feel, you, coming and working with Pac, how did, how did you feel when he, when you, you heard he'd been shot at Quad right before he went in? Uh, the second time? Or the first time. The first time. I was in major, major shock because the only reason I wasn't there was because I was working with radio again. We were trying to finish his pro project and, and he wanted me to come to New York and I couldn't go because I was working on that. And then I remember being at the house and I was writing. We got out of the studio and I think I was writing a hook or something. I was laying in front of the TV and they were like, rapper Tupac is shot. And, and I'm like, what? And they were like at Quad Studios. And I'm like, I would have been there. I would have been there. And I was mad because A, I wasn't there. Not like I could have done anything. I might have got shot myself. But just wanted to support him, you know? Yeah. And yeah, that was that was kind of tough. But after that, I thought he was invincible. Because when he got shot again, I was like, oh, no, he'll live through this. A lot of people did. Yeah. Um, sorry, I lost my place. How are we on time, guys? We're doing great. We're doing great. <laughs> What's that? Right, mm -hmm. All right. Well, when Pac signed to Death Row, we well, there's a notable there's a notable lack of Mosey tracks on Death Row. Um, did you keep in contact with him then? And yeah, we'll start. Did you keep in contact with him then? Well, I tried to, but we had had a conversation when I was working with him where I was explaining to him that I didn't want to work with Death Row. That I didn't want to, I, I had issues with Suge, I had issues with you know his brother, and I did not 
want to be involved in the kind of business that they did. And I, I explained to him that he shouldn't either. And he was like, but you know, Dr. Dre is my favorite producer. I said, he's my favorite producer too. But you're like, that's not gonna help you in your situation with, you know, making sure your money is straight. And then I, I told him, you know, things that I heard from the horse's mouth or how they do things. And he was like, I'm Tupac. You know, the, the IRS took my car. I went the same day and bought another car cash. And I was like, okay, I understand. But this the way they do business. It's not going to benefit you. And then, you know, we find out 20 years later that that's exactly what happened. They were holding on to his money. They were putting things that he was supposed to own. They were putting them in other people's names and keeping it away from him. He was, his mom sued them to get all this money back that they were supposed to give him and didn't. And so when he went to death row, I guess he kind of subconsciously knew that I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna do it. I wasn't gonna be involved. And I tried to call him just to keep in touch with him. And I think I might have called Edie's number at the time. I can't remember, but they were all at the studio and I remember talking to Edie and I talked to K-Dogs and I was like, so where's Pop? You know, let me talk to him. He said, well, he's, he's right here. I said, let me holler at him, man. And he said, well, he doesn't really want to talk. And I was like, oh, what is this? Is this, is this the, you know, about that? Did I do something, you know? I, don't, I didn't know if he was upset because he was in jail and none of us could really put anything on his books. You know, I'm like, if you're in jail, I'm not even either. Because, you know, I'm with you. He was going to take our label, Funk House, and put it out. Huh. My sister was going to be first, Keela. At the time, she was going by uh, Killer. It's, you know, it was Keela, but she was spelling the Killer. And she sang on his stuff. And, um, and then my cousin, Ron, from NGN, he's on um, uh, uh, Throw Your Hands Up. Yes. He's on the hook on that and, and the intro and stuff. Was that Machiavelli Records? Was it? No, that was that was still the Tupac stuff. We thought all of that was going to be on Me Against the World. Okay. Um, a lot of people that I've talked to have said that Tupac's original intent from the very beginning was to have his own independent record company. Yeah. Is that what you mean, uh, talking about putting yeah, out your sister in Funkhouse Records? Yeah, because he had his label called Out the Gutter, mm -hmm. and he was going to piggyback Funkhouse with it, and, you know, I was going to be his producer, everything he needed, I was going to do, me and Mike Mosley and, um, you know, a uh, few people that he had under his belt, we were going to, you know, work that out and bring in artists and stuff. And in fact, when um, he went to, when he went to death row, after the fact, me, my dad, you know, Funk House, uh, Tupac's manager at the time, Adrian Gregory, and Shock G, we had a deal on the table with Interscope. We were gonna put all our resources together and put it out, and had the lawyers in and paperwork and everything. And then they came in there one day and they said, listen, we can't give you guys the deal. And we're like, what happened? We're not asking for that much. And they're like, well, we just gave $10 million to Dr. Dre. So he started Aftermath. And, um, yeah, it was just... Was that, to backtrack a little bit, yeah. the, with the money situation in Death Row, was that kind of what you were hearing before he had went, what you were trying to warn him against? Yeah, was, that, yeah. was, was he in prison when, when, when you were trying to warn him about that before, before he signed? Before he went to prison. Okay, yeah. yeah. It was when we first started working. Because Sugar had been after him for a while, right? Yeah. Yeah. Since that above the rim. But he wanted to be a part of it, too. It was both sides. They, they wanted to figure out how to make it work, you know, so they can do records together. All these years later, uh, what's that make you smile memory working with Tupac? Um, I'm going to say the respect level that um, a lot of times I come to a, a, a thing where I'm given you, when you, you meet someone and you want to do a project they, it's a certain way that they, they like send me beats let me hear what you can do and then they're like you know it's too much cowbell it's you know it's, and you're like 
do you do beats? Like, do you want to rap over it? Or I mean, you know, we can work all that stuff out later. And, and he knew from, I guess, you know, of course, being in the business, he knew that there was a process to work it, to make everything right. So he played his role right. He came in there, was super creative, recorded it, and was gone. There were times he had three studios booked, work on my song, do his vocal, go to the next studio while I'm doing my thing. Mosey, you just handle what you got to handle. Where I get other cats that they're like, they want to sit there the whole time. No, that's too loud. That's too dope. That's too, you know, instead of letting me work. But I, I would say that was the biggest part to me that was the most fun is that he, he, he let me do my thing. Now, you, you had spoke earlier when we were talking about Funkhouse Records that the music scene has kind of changed direction to more of a digital um, type of situation. Other than digital, what do you think... Um, the difference is between the music that you started out producing and the music that we hear today? The music that we hear today is less filtered. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm sorry. It's, it's less filtered in a sense of um, uh, because everything is so independent, uh, a lot of choices are being made on the music that are based on finances. So you're looking at, okay, well I can get this beat for cheap, I, you know, and I can rap over it or I can sing over it, and they're not, I don't want to pay an engineer, a studio and everything, I want it to be like this and just try to make it sound the best that it can be. Whereas when, when we made records before, there were people who tried to make sure that we followed the, the criteria to make it sound like it's supposed to sound. You know, when you hear it on the radio, it sounds like, wow, versus there's something wrong. Like, you know, you and you hear it, you don't necessarily know, and people who don't know music, they don't necessarily know. And I can name off a lot of things, but I don't want it to feel like it's an attack on the creativity of today's music. Because it's not an attack on the creativity as much as the work ethic in making it the best that it could be. There's a reason they do what they do. Right. I mean, you know, people are in their place for a reason. That works that same way in the film industry that, you know, you look at 50 people standing around wondering what they do. But it, when it comes time, mm -hmm. they do their job and it's been proven they're there for a reason. And when you start pulling those pieces out, right. you lose quality steps in mm -hmm. the middle, you know, right in the middle of that. And they're doing things the like, if you equate it to, to, to movies, they would want to do a movie with Brad Pitt, but they want the whole rest of the cast to be unknown because they're my friends, we want to get them on, but I only want to pay Brad Pitt a little amount of money and we're going to record it with this little phone. You know what I mean? And we Absolutely. want the best quality, but Brad Pitt's in it. So you gotta buy it. You, you wanna see this movie. Well, not really. Yeah. You know? Well, speaking of music quality, um, I, and I've said it to you before, I'm gonna be a fan here. But one of my favorite tracks uh, that you've worked on recently was So Long Beat Strong. Oh. Can you tell us a little bit about that song? How it came to be and what it's like to work with Little Half Dead? It's, it's, it's kinda odd. I was working with Little Half Dead on his album called Dead Serious. This was about 2012, maybe? 2011? And um, I was, I always listen to Earth, Wind & Fire because they are like, when I put it on, I feel like, oh yeah, it feels good for my soul. So I'm listening to this song and I'm not really knowing what they're saying in the, in the thing. And my ex-wife, she comes in the room, she goes, are they saying so long be strong? And I went, I think they are. <laughs> I mean, no, they're not, but I think that could work. So I spent a whole lot of time trying to come up with a hook before I even did the music to fit it. And she goes, you should just repeat so long, be strong, and, and do the harmonies that they're doing. I'm like, okay. So I took it and did the track and flipped it and everything, and Half Dead loved it. And it just, I mean, it's like a Long Beach classic right now. You know, people really digging that. Yeah, like I said, it's, yeah. it's one of my favorites now. Thank you. Um, <laughs> how does how does little half dead style compare to working with the likes of a Tupac? Um, 
it's a different process. Uh, half is he's real creative, you know. He's all the time creative because you know you hear the stuff that he did with Snoop. Like I don't want anybody to get the wrong. You know, what I mean, he's super creative. Uh, he he vibes off of listening to the track. So like a lot of times with him, I, I have to do the track first and then you know vibe it from there and and build it. You know. Uh, some of them I, I kind of had, I try to have most of the concept already done so that he could walk in and go, oh yeah, you know, and just go at it. Um, with, with Pac, it was more like he was kind of um, uh, writing as I worked. Like as I was working, he was, it was going. It wasn't the inspiration of the music. Like a stream of consciousness it's thing. A stream of con exactly. <laughs> Sorry, no, you're two fine. bits from the peanut gallery over here. You know. yeah. um, I kind of have to address the elephant in the room. Did he ever mention to you about writing the song Brenda's Got a Baby? No. In fact, he mentioned to me the quite opposite of that. Did he? They had nothing to do with that. And all of those rumors and stuff about that are completely false. And. He, he talked. The, the guy was saying that on Half's album cover, it showed Tupac and his friend slumped over in Can Am Studio. Now I happen to know the guy who did the cover, Shalif. Shalif did not even think nothing like that. He loves Pac to the fullest, and he wanted to make something creative. He took something out of a magazine and animated it and and made the characters do this and all that but he didn't realize that that was the studio that Pockenham was working out of can -Am, in the magazine that he animated so he animated it put the people there and you know we went on about our business we dropped the album and everything it was just like no biggie and then i, I would see this news report about a little half dead uh being involved with killing tupac I'm like, well, first of all, I believe that little half dead was in jail when Tupac got killed. For one. Two, I believe he was in jail when Pac had Brenda's got a baby. <laughs> that's three. So it's like, um, yeah, no, no. That's completely false. Little half dead is the homie. He had nothing to do with that at all. He loved Pac. Was he a Pac fan? Yeah. He knew him personally too. I mean, you know, it was like, I don't know if you know, Little Half Dead is Nate Dogg's first cousin and Butch Cassidy. They're all first cousins. Wow. Their mothers are, well, and, and Little Half Dead's dad, their mothers, their brother and sisters. So I've known this family since, since I was a baby. They, his grandmother was like my grandmother to me. So I, I've known them forever. And, uh, no. Has he ever laughed that off, dude? No, he was very upset. He is not happy about that. He Every time I bring it up, trying to laugh and just about it, he's like very upset. Now he's talking about suing the guy. I think they I think they are suing him, the guy. Who, okay. And he tried to withdraw his statement after he got found out. Sorry. No, don't worry. Um, and just just because it's in the air, yeah. how do how do you feel? Because Sugar Bag gets a bad rap. How do you feel about people that all all these years later with the Orlando Anderson it being pretty apparent in the public eye or the public perception? How do you feel about people that think that Sugar Bag had something to do with Tupac's death? Well, that's a hard one. I'm not. Um, I'm not saying he did have something to do with it, but I'm not going to say he didn't. I think that he was part of the problem uh, as far as them being sought after. You know, he did a lot of things to build up to that. Should have did. But that had nothing to do with Tupac. Like, they had run-ins with Orlando, with Puffy, like, beforehand. Before this situation with him and Tupac getting into it, in Atlanta, I saw a report on that where they, uh, one of, I think it may have been one of Suge's people was, no, it was Orlando's people, the one, one of them that was in the car with him when he shot. You're talking about Jake Rhodes? Maybe. 
Yes. Okay. So he was talking about how Puffy was uh, seeing Orlando in different places, try to be in good with him because he knew that he was opposite of Suge. And basically was like, you know, he was like, if you need me, dude, you know, I'll take care of something, you know. And Puffy's like, you know, just chill, just chill. And and then eventually it got to the point where Suge kept, I think Suge shot somebody that was in Puffy's camp and then they got upset about it and shot somebody over here. And Now, I, I know that we're talking about someone that you knew personally. So do, do you feel that Suge put, was was the one with the target, that Suge was walking around with the target on his back? I think he had the biggest target, yeah. I think he did. But I think Pop made his target a little bigger, just, you know, trying to ride for Suge and ride for, you know, what he felt. He made his target a little bit bigger. He already had a target on him from not just the gangs, but that seemed like America. You know what I mean? It seemed like to me. And he just... Uh, When he when he started talking about MOB and being you know blood and all that stuff, I just I knew it was down the wrong path because it's not like everybody think the gang banging is not like a glorified thing you know like people don't do it because they want to be popular they do it because they don't some of them do it because they don't want to die where they are you know they you 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 be down or you lay down. A lot of times it's the situation. You know, if you live in this neighborhood, you have to be down, be protected by us, or you're gonna be terrorized by us, kind of thing. But I think that, you know, he was really into the people and saw people pass that, but he just didn't realize that gang stuff is like, it's not the same. They, they don't, think different, I mean, they don't think the same as people who just do crimes, you know, just, you know, a lot of people do crimes. Yeah. It's just a different brain pattern. I always don't like when I go down the dark. This yeah, right? Let's, let's <laughs> uplift it a little bit. Um, Soul Finger, mm -hmm. can you tell people what your favorite track is off of it? plug it where they can get it, where fans can, who want some Mosey production, where they can go to you and, and get that. Okay, okay. Well, Soul Finger, my, my first single is called Set Me Free. And it's like a dance kind of cut, real laid back, but real smooth. Um, the album itself is, is really geared towards uh, a different thing in music. I drew from the old school, I drew from the new school, I drew from different genres, blended, and tried to write songs that were geared towards love and uh, not just like a sexual, you know, I'm hot for you kind of thing, but more of like relationships, up and down, you know, good or bad. And um, I haven't made the album available yet because I'm getting the promotion together. But that's going to be the first single. Uh, Who are you going to release that through? I'm, I'm going to shop a deal to Universal. Initially, I was going to do it independent and um, try to do the promotion myself. Um, but, you know, since my dad passed, it made it difficult. It made my role just a little more difficult uh, business-wise because I have a lot of things that's keeping me from business-wise making it solid. So, um... I would say that made me have to revamp and rethink and, and, and try to get a distribution deal to, to facilitate it. I'm still going to operate it like an independent slash major because the, the artists I have are going to have their own labels, independent labels under mine. It's like an umbrella. Mm -hmm. That's how I view Funk House. But Soul Finger is going to be a different thing. It's, it's going to be something that is missed. And to the, the, the young ones who've never heard this kind of music, it's going to be definitely a new light for you to, to draw creatively from and um, just to show you how bad I think the album is, I made 35 songs and chose 16. The best 
That's a lot of tracks on one record. I, t- I took the other ones off. But yeah, even 16 yeah, like these 16. days. Yeah, that's, <laughs> what I that's, a, that's a full album. That's a full 80 minutes. Taking it back to the old school. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah, in fact, that would have been a double album back in the day. Exactly. You've been a double album. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Now, you're, you're a real producer. Mm-hmm. You play live instrumentation. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you, know, you also do the variety. Mm-hmm. Um, and you actively produce. Where can people who, are, who have serious inquiries about Mosey production, getting someone who's produced platinum-selling albums, where can they go to get at you? for serious, serious inquiries on, on production. Okay, um, I would say you can get in contact with me uh, through my Facebook. It's Mosey, M-O-E-Z-M-D, Facebook, or Twitter, same, M-O-E-Z-M-D. And uh, inbox me or, yeah, just get my attention. If, if you need some production, um, you know, it may cost a little bit, but my process is different. But you're going to get quality. You're going to get platinum sounding. I'm going to come with my end. You come with your end. <laughs> and your ends. <laughs>Hey all, it's J-Mix here, and I want to thank everybody that took the time to watch the video. If you liked it, go ahead and throw it a like, maybe even a comment down below. And if you really like my content, check out my Patreon. The link is down below. For a dollar a month, you get all the live streams, unedited as soon as they happen, plus interviews in advance and other bonus content. The link is in the description. If not, you guys could always watch one of the videos to the side of me. See you on the next upload. One love, everybody.